officially. Thank you everyone for joining this session here. Microsoft and open source, yes indeed. Open source managed databases and IPIs with Rafael Santiago Acerandio Garcia and uh, Sudhir Ravat. Rafael um, is uh, responsible for sales and marketing as an operations executive with strong experience on business and industry, technology and cloud, digitally transforming customers in Americas, Europe and Asia. Additional key points about Rafael, executive management and operations, multinational management consulting, industrial and startup, all these topics. 20 years international experience as a founder, entrepreneur, strategy, consultant, seller, marketer, or leader, and technical competence on AI, data analytics, Kubernetes, IoT, serverless, and DevOps. And uh, Raphael has an MBA in IESE um, Business School, and uh, Masters of Electrical Engineering at uh, UC3M, Electrical Engineer, AI and Management, and UNED Bachelor of science and economics. Wow, that's impressive numbers of degree. Raphael, thank you very much for joining us and welcome here at the event. And your microphone is muted. Uh, um, yeah. That's one of the of the of the things this year, no? Your, your microphone is muted. I cannot hear or I cannot see you. Anyway, uh, thank you, Mario, for for the uh, introduction. Very very pleased to to be uh, here. It's, it's a pleasure for us to be speaking from Singapore. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know which time zones you guys are. Um, my name is Rafa, as Mario was sharing, and I work in in Microsoft Corporation in what we call worldwide commercial business, which is the uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, strategy sales team, uh, part of what we call internally global black belts, nothing to do with karate or something like that, but a very specialized unit uh, driving um, a special workloads. Um, I'm driving sales now in Asia, and I would like to, to talk to you today about uh, Microsoft's approach to, to open source, um, not only from an internal point of view, but also how are we enabling uh, our customers, and specifically, you know, how Microsoft is doing for developers, and we will double click on uh, databases and APIs, right? So uh, that, that's the agenda for today. I have with myself uh, Sudhir uh, Rawat that uh, will also do a practical demo, a technical demo. Uh, Sudhir, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself uh, at the beginning. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sudhir, and I work as an Azure Dev Team with Microsoft. Uh, I've been in Microsoft for the past uh, 40 years, uh, working on different uh, technologies, uh, specific on the data and the AI field. And I'm excited to join my colleague Rafael and walk you through some cool demos and technologies how we are actually embracing the open source technologies in Azure. So looking forward. Over to you, Rafael. Thank you, Sudhir. So let's uh, go with it. Um, first of all, I would like to to tell talk about a little bit about myself. Uh, and though Mario made a big, uh, I would say very big introduction already. Uh, I've been working for Microsoft already for eight years. I indeed started in Microsoft um, in Europe driving open source um, for the for the region. Uh, eight years ago was exactly the year of the transition when uh, Satya Nadella was stepping in and, um, and the company was making, I would say, was already making four years, right? But th th that was clearly when um, everything started changing dramatically. Um, and Microsoft. Now, I, I can say that in these eight years, I've been helping uh, many customers, uh, startups, developers, uh, big companies, as well companies, and partners to drive their beloved open source technologies into uh, our platform. And um, I can say, you no, know, after this journey, like uh, if there was a war uh, between, let's say, Microsoft or I would say the commercial software and the open source software, definitely open source won, no? Um, companies are uh, adopting open source uh, heavily, I would say. We'll talk about a little bit in the next few slides. Uh, developers, communities, ISVs are launching more than ever new projects. Um, and I would say also cloud vendors are 
you know, leveraging uh, all this innovation. Um, some, I would say, are enabling and supporting the communities, uh, but uh, the approach is quite different. No, I, I can definitely say um, that uh, if Microsoft was evil when I started in technology many years ago with Debian in a in a small hostel in Spain, uh, that's what we were doing. We were on on the non, uh, let's say, uh, production. Um, uh, we were having in production. Non, with non-production uh, packages and, and versions, um, Microsoft was the evil at that time, right? And, and I can say now it's God probably, if you think how Microsoft is doing with open source communities and with um, ISVs and, and partners. I will talk a, lot, a little bit about uh, this on, on over, uh, all over the, the slides. Microsoft is deeply committed to, to uh, helping our customers to create uh, better solutions uh, through open source software. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, for our uh, customers, um, you know, our cloud needs to be fully supportive of open source technologies, but it also needs to be a compliant, um, you know, a trustful with the community and, and the ISVs. No? So our um, approach to open source is to have a, a, a fully open source in Azure, right? Whenever you play um, with a service, and we will talk about databases today, you, you are you are talking to, for example, Postgres community. You are not talking to a four. You are not talking to um, any any other thing. No. So I think this quote from Satya Nadella. You remember when we acquired GitHub uh, uh, some months ago, years, not many, but a couple. Um, uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, noise from a few, I would say, uh, that, you know, GitHub is gone, it's going to be out of the game, it's going to, Microsoft is going to swallow it. I, I read many things, right? At that time, we were in a uh, kind of on the trench uh, on trying to, to, to get out of the FUD. But uh, definitely, look at GitHub today, you know, and I think uh, this quote at that time he made, I think it was Financial Times, like uh, Satya said, like you need to judge us for what we do, no, and what we are doing, and not what uh, for what a few of people say. So I think that that's a clear statement on where Microsoft stands for for open source. But let's go into specifics. No, I think um, open source uh, is is uh, is becoming key to enable this uh, vision of of shared worldwide uh, shared development that probably now in this COVID nineteen. At times, it's become even more, um, how to say, real, no? Because people really need to co-develop from uh, different places, and and the idea of uh, um, doing that in in real time, no, uh, in the way that probably the community has been doing for years, um, is becoming real for a need for many many organizations, no? So, open source is is really a key differentiator in differentiator for enterprises um, that are interested in driving digital transformation. Um, based on McKinsey research, um, open source is a is a is a differentiator already. It's the biggest differentiator of top performing organizations. Um, these organizations, according to this research, um, are seeing three times more impact from the adoption of open source than the rest of the industry and organizations who are best in class in open source are also uh, scoring 30 percent higher on innovation and 20 percent higher on developer uh, satisfaction now if we think about the world today uh, companies are building uh, on software uh, uh, you know the, the industries are transforming into software industries i will say in the cloud and um, you know, open source is at the core of that, and developers are the new, uh, you know, <laughs> competitive advantage. So it's truly, truly important, no? Our customers definitely, I mean, if you look at our top 100 customers uh, worldwide, they all use open source technologies on Azure. Um, as you it couldn't be uh, in a different way, right? Um, you, you cannot expect uh, something, something different. but. Let's take a look at how uh, Microsoft uh, does open source, no? Because that, that's one of the of the questions that many people um, normally doesn't know, no? Um, and I would like to share a little bit of our journey, no? We we are, I would say, we are the single vendor, uh, the single cloud vendor that comes from a software development uh, history heritage, which is good and it's bad. You know, you have your heritage, uh, you you have very positive things. You have also 
um, other things that were not so positive, right? But uh, we approach open source um, from uh, a Microsoft software developer company. That means that we were not only focusing on the on how to leverage the open source projects uh, or how to you know interact and contribute with the community, but we were also heavily focused on building tools, building processes uh, to make easy for developers to use and contribute release open source software. In our journey, uh, we realize that we are part of the largest community, and and uh, we have uh, you know open sources open source many of the tools we found useful. And we are sharing, you know, a lot of our discoveries with others, and, and this is incremental. No, you, I think, uh, the market is recognizing uh, our openness in in that uh, in that sense. Going to specifics, no, Microsoft has an open source uh, program that encourages um, contribution, uh, respects uh, license obligations. So when, whenever any of our employees do a commit, we maintain that commit, we document that commit. We allow engineers uh, to use open source with ease, work in the open release projects and be completely secure, no? Think about it, I mean, um, in order to, to get, uh, uh, you know, our job done, our developers are using more than 60,000 open source components in, in more than uh, 9.5 million uh, uh, places, right? So this really allow us to focus on, on innovation. We also see a, a culture that is created by open source is attractive to job seekers. And let's be very clear, there's a clear, a clear competition for talent. Um, and that's really important, uh, I would say, in the open source uh, projects to foster talent and to invest in their career development. And I can speak here about myself, right? Uh, as an open source believer, definitely I'm practitioner. Um, I got into Microsoft to, to change Microsoft from the from the inside, no, and and I could not work for Microsoft if Microsoft were not doing as they were doing uh, these days. So Microsoft contributions to to open source, now very quickly, and just to give uh, a couple of perspectives, I think our upstream contributions to the Linux kernel span over a decade, no, and go beyond interoperability. That I think was. Uh, uh, this Bill Gates manifesto of many years ago goes more on, on you know, securing hardware enablement, uh, testing thousands of Linux images at a scale, improving networking and storage and scenarios, in addition to uh, working beyond the code in areas such as uh, LF and TAB, an industry-wide Linux uh, security initiative, right? We're also making uh, Kubernetes easier for organizations to adopt. Uh, Microsoft has tripled the number of employees who participate in the open source project related to Kubernetes. Uh, for example, uh, the APR uh, that enable customers to use an event-driven portable runtime for building microservices on the cloud, or open service uh, mesh, I think uh, many of you will know, uh, a lightweight and extensible cloud native uh, service mesh. Um, when it comes to our data and AI, and that's uh, my area, we are definitely dedicated to the spirit of open source and we contribute back to the community heavily, I would say. A great example is our PostgreSQL. We have welcomed four of uh, the PostgreSQL committers to our engineering team um, who work in the improvement of, of uh, the open source Postgres. And we continue to support Citus open source project. I don't know if you remember about Citus, but that was Citus data acquisition a few years ago. We are definitely, you know, letting Citus to continue being completely open source. Um, we also make uh, upstream contributions to a variety of programming languages and web frameworks and technologies as Node.js, Python, PHP, Webpack, and many more, right? For example, our TypeScript programming language, which is developed in the, in the open, uh, helps teams to build JavaScript apps at scale. So these are just uh, some, uh, how, how, you know, some, some examples, no? But there are many more. But how that works, how does, does it work inside uh, Microsoft? We, we could have something called Microsoft Open Source Programs Office, uh, OSPO, as we say uh, internally. Basically, it's a governance uh, of uh, how Microsoft engineers and employees do open source in Microsoft. Um, and I can, I, I, might, I mean, if you are interested, I can, I can share more information, right? But that definitely, there are very large companies that have been having a lot of interest in learning how Microsoft, uh, uh, as I said, a uh, software company, um, you know, uh, adopted Microsoft in a very structured way 
um, and adopted the methodologies uh, to contribute and to uh, work with the community and enable. So um, very interesting. In a summary, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go into many, many details, but basically we document all our software policies and make them available to all employees. So you need to know, and, and, and there's some level of compliance there, what you are going to do whenever you are releasing open source. Uh, so people can really act very independently at the same time, right? So there's no like a, a bottleneck that you need to, to get the OSPO, the legal, like in the past, no? I remember at the beginning it was not that way. Um, using open source in Microsoft is definitely encouraged. Anytime uh, we use a, a component in Microsoft, we make sure we register all of them and follow any required distribution requirements. And we also encourage our employees to, to contribute to community, you know, uh, so beyond like the specific uh, projects going through um, the release of, of checklists and, and help us make sure that the important aspects of any contributions uh, to the open source community are done properly. But not only that, we also uh, contribute and participate with many, uh, you know, open source uh, projects. We also believe um, how important it is to contribute and participate uh, with the um, with the foundations. These foundations provide a place for people to collaborate, and we are super proud to to participate, to partner, to sponsor, and and to work in amazing initiatives. You know, for a better uh, open source ecosystem. With that, if we can play the video now, please. Okay. So, um, I don't know if you can give me control back. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much. We played the video this, this way, the, the commercial video, because I, I thought that it was uh, much better to, uh, to listen, right? We, we did some tests and it was not <laughs> ideal. Anyway, let's go, let's go into open source for, for developers, right? What, uh, what open source has changed Software development dramatically. You know, I I can I can think even recently, like one two years ago. I mean, no 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 single person or team can make any progress uh, that we cannot make all together um, now. No, in this uh, in this world, and Azure is developer centric. As I told you, I mean, we are we are a developer company. We were born for developers, and and now we are also born for any developer, which is fantastic. No. Um, Let's talk first about the immense potential that you have to scale your apps on Azure. No, Azure is the world's uh, computer, and Azure is completely global. Um, we also have been uh, rapidly building our Azure regions. We have now 66, more than 66 uh, regions, which is not data centers around the world. Uh, this allows us to run uh, your apps uh, very close to your, uh, you know, employees, customers, and and you know, comply with the data residency requirements. We also recently announced uh, new regions in Israel, in Mexico, in Spain, Italy, Poland, New Zealand, 
and Indonesia very recently indeed. With Azure today, you can build and deploy um, your applications at uh, infinite scale. GitHub. Um, what can I say about GitHub? I think I think everybody you know have been working with with GitHub. I don't know if uh, everybody has worked with GitHub um, and and with a DevOps methodology and and with a cloud uh, behind. Right? It's amazing. I, I definitely invite you all to to test it uh, with us. Um, collaboration is great. Um, develop development teams, no, uh, and between teams and the community, which is something that I really like from, from GitHub and, and the way uh, that they not only empower collaboration internally uh, with, uh, with, um, with their tool, but also how this inner sourcing you know, and how the interaction with the community uh, um, is also um, uh, working, is fantastic experience, let's say. Um, now, uh, you know, software developing is, is a world largest team sport and GitHub can help you expand beyond your team. And this done uh, securely. So GitHub is the single platform that has an end-to-end -end vision for security for open source projects to deploy to deploy code. Um, and we have invested in innovation to help all developers uh, to work with security for, for for their companies, as I was saying, also to keep that, let's say, uh, compliance. Visual Studio Code. I suppose that many of you also know it uh, and, and use it, no? Our users. So uh, to build uh, productively and, and collaborate globally, Visual Studio Code is for free. It's open source and runs in multiple platforms. Uh, you can use over 20,000 extensions built by the community and stay productive locally, remotely, and, and even on a browser, right, with code space. Uh, definitely a great tooling. And Azure. Yeah, uh, an end-to-end -end platform, right? I mean, just in a glimpse, you see uh, that you can build rich applications, serverless, enable them with AI, with a very simple API, you know, leverage very powerful algorithms. Do it at the edge, even, uh, with the HoloLens and the new MESS version that was um, released in Ignite a, a few days ago, relying on a solid enterprise infrastructure uh, powered with the best developer uh, tools. But let's go specifically on, on open source, right? Um, I mean, Linux. Linux, in fact, is 60% of our uh, offering in the marketplace is Linux, is based on Linux. Um, not to mention some of our uh, first party products like uh, Azure Red Hat OpenShift or uh, Flexible Server on PostgreSQL. 100% um, community edition versions. That's something that uh, many people doesn't know, but we, you know, I said at the beginning, but I insist, we run open source. So we, we offer open source, truly open source. We don't do forms. We don't do our own versions of things. It's basically the community version or the partner version itself. That's one of the good things of Microsoft, I would say, that has been always a partner-oriented company, you know, and, and it's true. And, and it's true also for the open source ecosystem. We are not, let's say, benefiting from the partners. We are working with the partners to offer their solutions through our uh, platform. And then uh, flexibility of choice. With uh, Azure, you can see uh, confidently uh, using enterprise-grade Kubernetes service. Um, Azure supports your favorite open source tools, languages, third-party integration of choice. Whatever you build apps on Java, Node.js, Python, .NET, we support your tools, your languages, and your integrations. And databases. I will talk about uh, databases in a, in a second. So open source databases, right? That's my field. Um, across Azure, uh, fully uh, managed databases, we bring top quality enterprise grade features to open source. So customers can build open source databases, can focus on their applications, and let us manage the database. To be honest, uh, you know, in the 21st century, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be managing the database if you are a developer. I mean, much easier, much better. It just scales up and down. Um, you don't need to worry, and it's very cost effective. Um, we, we bring, let's say, the best of, of both worlds, right? You have all the benefits from a true open source community. Um, and I, I don't want to insist the third time, but it's a true open source community that make us be always, let's say, one version behind the community version, because we really want to release the community version. Um, we couple with enterprise ready features, no, like a scale, high availability, security, lower rate, um, in a fully managed environment, either MySQL, Postgres, MariaDB, or 
uh, redis for for uh, uh, azure cache um these databases are 100 percent community with open also open extension support right uh, two also for our NoSQL database, Azure Cosmos DB. Uh, developers can get API support for MongoDB up to 4.0 now. Apache Cassandra has been released, um, as I said, days ago. And also Gremlin, a benefit from an elastic scalability and automatic data replication across regions. So all these, re uh, all, all these databases are fully managed. I will talk uh, a little bit uh, about this No, What is the advantage? First of all, um, fully community. Uh, I won't repeat again. Not a fork. There's no login. You can put it up. You can put it down back on premise. You are always, uh, your code is going to be always compliant with the community. Second, unparalleled TCO. We have no competitor here. For a given SLA, um, we can be as cheap as half. Uh, and, and whenever, if you guys want to have a, a deeper conversation, I'm eager to have that conversation. Hyperscale, quite a unique uh, value proposition to scale out uh, a certain nothing architecture uh, for specifically for multi-tenant applications or even very high performance applications. I'm thinking, for example, here on an Exa data, we beat performance on an Exa data. Uh, security, part of our solutions with uh, advanced threat potential and IP advantage. IP advantage is something that many people, specifically many open source and players and, and developers doesn't know, but Microsoft back you up uh, against law suites with all our patents whenever you are uh, working on our platform with IP advantage. Take a look in because it's super interesting for, for ISVs and specifically for small ISVs and startups that you know can get, let's say, in a very serious trouble if they, if they, if they get into a legal uh, patent uh, discussion with one of these lawsuits. Uh, build in intelligence, right? So we optimize database performance by creating and dropping indexes, uh, um, and it gives you recommendations, and you just click and execute them. And, and definitely fully integrated with our the rest of our platform, Kubernetes, AI, APIs, Power BI, serverless, web app service. PostgreSQL, four deployment um, options. One single, single server, uh, fully managed, very competitive for a given SLA, 99.99 high availability, flexible server, still in preview, uh, is so redundant, uh, and you can control the maintenance uh, window, hyperscale, I already explained, and Azure Arc, uh, so you can run uh, on a hybrid across clouds, right? So you can run it on-premise, uh, and we have customers very interested in doing uh, these kind of things, and we are working in, in several projects. Last but not least, uh, Cosmos DB. Uh, simple, no? For me, it's like the mainframe of the 21st century on the cloud. It's multi-API, all uh, open source API compliant. As I said before, uh, MongoDB 4.0, Apache Cassandra, Gremlin. It's globally distributed, but it's multi-master with five different consistency models that give you the flexibility on how you want to do the, the writes. 99.999, so five nines, a uh, very low latency for read and writes, and immediate el elasticity. Uh, you know, it, it follows your traffic patterns. You don't need to wait like 24 hours to, to, to adapt your, I mean, this is something that uh, customers realize whenever they are in production, and they put these two, or, or we do pilots, now they put uh, our solution and other solutions, and they see the difference on, on how fast uh, uh, Cosmos DB adapts to the, a traffic uh, a pattern almost automatically. So that's uh, all on my side. Um, as I said, Azure empowers your developer teams to build you know, your way uh, with the support of your open source uh, tools, languages, third party integrations of choice. We are helping the development uh, of code to collaborate, to ship uh, either your internal or customer facing applications. No matter where you are, a river developer is welcome and definitely urge you to, to try uh, to test um, and to judge us for what we do and, and uh, let us know, definitely eager to take any feedback. As follow-ups on my side, if you want to continue the journey, there's an ongoing uh, Microsoft uh, Open uh, Azure Day uh, right now. So if you want to sign up here, you have the QR code. And uh, also a very interesting woman in AI, only 25 seats. So if you are a woman and you want to learn AI, um, take, a, take a screenshot now and 
enroll on the on the program. And with that, uh, thank you very much. I will be I will stay in on, on the chat. And if there are any questions or if you want to reach out uh, LinkedIn, um, just just send an email uh, or or a LinkedIn message. Uh, I'm happy to to uh, talk and continue the conversation. With that, Sudhir, all yours. Let's go for the interesting part, which is the technical part, the demo. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Right. I'm just waiting if I get a. Can I get a speaker right so that I can share my screen? All right, so let me just say share my screen. One, share it. And I would appreciate if someone can just confirm me uh, if you guys are able to view my screen. Yes, we see it uh, fine and clear. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone joining us today. and. Uh, very nice presentation given by my colleague Rafael. And as I mentioned, you know, we actually uh, bring all these open source uh, technologies near to you so that you can, uh, you don't have to learn new technologies, right? And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, in this demo, I'm going to walk you through the PostgreSQL. Uh, and we're going to do uh, a little bit of fun uh, with PostgreSQL uh, and all the uh, different types of. Uh, often that they have in the PostgreSQL, right? Uh, as Rafael mentioned in his, in his slide, right? So if you go to the Azure portal um, and say, I want to create a resource and you can say, let's say PostgreSQL and it comes over here. And now what I can do is uh, I can just click on the create. And as you can see, uh, as you can see over here, uh, as Rafael mentioned uh, that we have a various options for you to, you know, to uh, quickly set up the PostgreSQL server. So you can go with a single server, you can go for the hyperscale, you can go for the flexible server, or maybe if you want to uh, enable the Azure Arc, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to monitor your hyperscale PostgreSQL, you can actually go to do that as well, right? Now, one of the questions you might think is, you know, why do we have Postgre in a different version, right? Uh, and it's because, that every organizations have a different requirement, right? Maybe you want to just quickly build and a kind of a, a sample app, or maybe you know you don't need too much of scalability, and hence you know you go for the single server. Uh, whereas if you are running on a, a production database, which is a huge amount of data that you are storing, and as well as doing the query on that, you're probably going to look into the hyperscale. Now, if you want to do, uh, you know, have a more control, uh, that's where you're going to look into the flexible server, right? Now, I'm not going to create what I did it. I've already created a few of these databases. And if I go, let's say, the single server, now, by default, we don't allow, uh, when the server is spin up, we don't allow it to connect, right? So that is the one of the security uh, that we enable by default onto the show. Now, uh, it's totally up to you uh, to whom you want to give the access, whether you allow uh, other Azure services to talk uh, to the PostgreSQL server or the box, you can configure it, or maybe if you want to give uh, different firewalls uh, to access um, your PostgreSQL, you can actually go ahead and configure that. Uh, this configuration that I put it over here, it's not the recommended. Uh, I have just put it for this demo, right? Uh, and as Rafael mentioned, you know, we also provide query performance and any kind of a performance recommendation, uh, you can actually go ahead and do it from the portal itself, right? It doesn't matter which kind of a server that you spin up, right? At, at the end of the day, what we want is we want you to focus more on providing the solutions to the customer rather than thinking about how can I uh, set up the security, how can I, you know, uh, set up the firewalls or network securities and so on and so forth, right? Now, Let's say we have this uh, database set up, and what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to have this uh, Postgre admin tool uh, through which I'm going to connect to my uh, PostgreSQL, which is hosted on Azure. So now you can see I've already connected uh, to my single server, my single server two, and the hyperscale servers 
over here. And all these three I have configured with a different uh, configuration. And I'm going to show you that. Now, just to get started, as you can see, I've connected one of the server. And I can actually go ahead and run this query. And as you can see that, you know, it flawlessly work. So if I'm coming from the PostgreSQL, I'm, you know, uh, working with my own tools, like, for example, Postgre uh, admin tool over here. I don't need to learn a new technologies. I can just go to the Azure portal. I can set up uh, the PostgreSQL in no time. And I can just come into my portal, uh, into my PG admin tool, which I'm very much familiar with. And I can start writing my query, right? And by the way, you must have been noticed that, you know, these are my social media pointers. Uh, so you can, you know, feel free to connect with me. Now, let's go ahead and do some fun. So, okay. So now, uh, with the configuration with a single server, uh, what I choose is the basic one, uh, which basically have a 2B course and 202 GB of uh, data that I can store, and it has around four uh, gigabytes of uh, RAM, right? And similarly, we have a different configuration for the uh, single server, which is the general purpose, um, which I can define four cores or eight cores and so forth. In the hyperscale, um, as we mentioned, you know, it is basically for the production where you have a huge amount of data. Uh, the architecture is a little different. Now, because it's a hyperscale server, behind the scenes, there's going to be one coordinator. Um, and then you'll have the various worker node, right? So what's going to happen is when you're going to send the query, the coordinator will take the request and, you know, send divided these queries in a different, let's say, task. And then, you know, give this task to the different worker behind the scenes to get the job done in parallel and give you the results back. Okay. Now, I'll come back to the uh, some of the metrics over here. Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'll just go back to my browser. And I'm not going to do the select uh, count star, which I've already did. And I'm going to show you the result of that. Now, I'm just going to run this query. So this is I've connected to my single server, uh, the basic one. I'll just go ahead and run this query. And how many record that's uh, it has so this is the number for the single server so it has uh, more than this uh, number of records uh, stored in the table okay uh, similarly for the general purpose uh, these are the record number and this is for the hyperscale uh, since it's a hyperscale we have a huge number of data that's stored over there so now i'll just go to the another instance of my single server 2 which is a general purpose i'm just going to run the same query over here and now one thing i want to uh, Keep that in your mind that I'm not actually doing any kind of a, uh, you know, I'm not doing any kind of a comparison between these server. What I'm trying to say is, you know, you're probably going to have a look into the different performance metrics that you can get it, right? So it's not a comparison. Depending on your workload that you want to run on the PostgreSQL, you can choose what kind of a server that you can get it, right? Now, here it does not give me any data because uh, it does not probably get uh, any data for the site uh, ID 28. And uh, let me just go back over here and run this command over here. Okay. Now, as you can see, uh, it's pretty quickly give me the results back in a one second. And if I go to the query history, um, and I get in one second, 801 milliseconds, right? So I can go back over here and say aggregated query take one second, and 801 milliseconds, okay? Uh, we don't have this, but I only have the comparison to this select count star, which basically gives me all the record that I have. Uh, for the single server, uh, because there's a huge amount of data, uh, it's gonna take some time to do that, right? Now, that's what I want you to think about it, you know, to think about what kind of a workload that you want to bring onto the PostgreSQL, right? It's not only about the tools that you learn about, but also choosing the right services uh, to provide the right set of performance uh, to your customers or to the solutions as well, right? Now, if I look on some of the numbers over here, uh, when I did a select count just before starting the session, you can see the single server with these many number of records, it took me around four minutes and 57 seconds uh, to get the results back, right? Whereas with a single server, which is 9538876 uh, number of records, it took me around two second, 220 milliseconds to get these uh, records out, right? Now with the hyperscale, uh, I have these many number of records and you can see that it basically gave me five seconds, 596 milliseconds to get this response back uh, from the server, right? 
Now, the time-wise, you can see there is a difference, but you can also look on to the number of rows that we are storing in both the different servers, right? Uh, the difference between these two servers is approximately 119755030. That means I have 13.55 times more records than the single server in the hyperscale server, right? So hyperscales already have a more server, uh, more records as compared to the single server, right? And and you can see, you know, uh, this is the response that I'm going to get it, right? So again, it's not a comparison, but then it's basically let's you think about it. We have the different options available on the Azure platform. You can choose what kind of a workload that you want to bring in onto the Azure and, you know, get started working. And the way you connect it with the Azure, uh, the PostgreSQL earlier, you're going to do the same with the Azure PostgreSQL server as well. Okay. So, that's pretty much I have for the quick demo. Uh, I would have been, you know, got on time, I would have been gone in more details. Uh, but that's all for the demo side. I hope you liked it. Uh, and if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to uh, Rafael or me, and we'll be more than happy to answer. And I will hand it over back to the moderator. Thank you very much. And um, I see. Yeah, I see that we have a few questions here and um, I would like to invite uh, Raphael to join us as well. And uh, uh, the first question is uh, from Mishari and uh, Mishari uh, says that he can also um, jump in and ask the question personally live here. So that's great. And by the way, I see like most questions seem to be uh, still, uh, like directed to Raphael, but if you have questions about Sudia, then um, yeah. Please also feel free to add them. Yeah, Mishari, please go ahead. Thanks, uh, thank, uh, thanks, Mario. You hear me okay? Okay. Um, hi, Rafael. Uh, a very interesting story, and especially um, when I first saw Microsoft uh, being a sponsor of Force Asia, I thought my life is over. I have no more purpose left. Or the other thought was, was I at the right conference? Um, <laughs> So, um, so, so, so that's that's a huge culture crash, uh, crash, right? Microsoft under um, um, under Bill Gates, under under Ballmer, and all of a sudden, uh, there's a, you do a 180. Surely, the um, the development team in there must be um, equally um, on um, on edge when all these changes was happening. So, um, so, so, how do how do you go? Um, is there is there like a difference between? Did you find that there's a difference uh, in the way that the developers approach the problems? Uh, when coming from, uh, say, an open source perspective, an agile perspective, and the your traditional, more waterfall-like pers perspectives, and was there a difficulty in transitioning um, in terms of um, mindsets and methodologies, et cetera, et cetera? For sure, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question, and indeed, there's um, there's a fantastic story about the Xbox team, how they are uh, shifting the way they work uh, through GitHub, not necessarily with open source, but the way they start doing modern development using open source technologies. Um, we are we are still in transition, Misari. So, I mean, that's a starting very humble approach, right? So we are not over. Uh, there's a still a lot of work uh, in progress. We continue developing uh, projects, uh, proprietary projects. Uh, but the good thing is now the company is rethinking every time you start a project, like it doesn't, doesn't make sense to do it ourselves or do we start in the community, right? That, that's that's the starting point. And from a process, culture, methodology, I think um, there was, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a video indeed from one of our head of engineering talking about how uh, the open source uh, change impacted the way they operate in a daily basis and, and how, um, how they needed to create this governance because, I mean, one thing I, I try to insist during my presentation when we, we do, we are very trustful in the way we do with the community and with the um, partners and with the ISB vendors um, in the open source ecosystem, and you can ask them. I mean, they love Microsoft now, really. I mean, uh, you can ask Red Hat, you can ask, uh, you blame it. I mean, they're, they're one of your flavor. There's no one that you will find blaming us uh, anymore, right? Uh, we are very, very fair in the way we are approaching them. Um, so uh, the transformation is still ongoing. Uh, the cultural change is still ongoing, but there's a massive 
uh, transformation. And I will tell you that it depends on the teams, right? Uh, if I can, I will find the video of Mario and I will probably start with you because it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a head of engineering, it's a Chinese person indeed, American Chinese, talking about uh, how, um, I mean, it was a kind of a discovery of the world. People that has been developing for years in an isolated way think that we have like, I don't know the number now, but close to 100,000 developers in Microsoft, right? It's a lot of people, but they were working, looking inside, no? And suddenly they opened to the world. It's massive. It's, it's a big, big change, uh, Misari, completely. Okay, thank you. Uh, if, if you have like a bunch of uh, resources of, like, about, about like how Microsoft is approaching open source and how it's transforming the culture, uh, do you mind st uh, sticking the URLs in the notes? Um, so that we can check it out later. I'm, I'm most keen to study about this more. Sure, um, just, very interesting. Just as, uh, uh, leading on for that, um, how do resources get allocated and get prioritized in, uh, in, um, in your open source project? There must be a conflict um, in, uh, in priorities between the, what the community wants and what Microsoft wants. Um, how do you guys get decide, how do you decide well, we, we, we are customer centric in that sense. So whenever the, um, the community, um, let's say, is taking the direction that the customer wants to take, we, we bet on that clearly, right? And, and whenever we feel uh, that the customer wants something different, we continue betting on, on, on our uh, view. But as I said, I mean, many of our first party products are the open source community products. So we are not releasing, which is a big difference, I would say, between vendors. We are not releasing our own story, no, our own version, our own fork of the community. We we, we stick to the community 100%. So we don't change. Um, we, of course, make it work in Azure. Yes, true. Uh, but we don't change uh, uh, the community version. So the way to prioritize, I would say, is, is really uh, customer oriented. Uh, but as we are part also of the community, we, we are part of the decision now and and, uh, and we need to follow uh, the decision, right, that we make uh, in consensus. Um, how are these decisions made? Is there a voting? Is it just a discussion and you just see the flow? How does that work? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of discussions. Uh, the, the way they organize, they are organized by, I would, how to explain, is more per workload. So there are engineering teams, developer teams, Imagine about, um, as I was uh, speaking, Xbox, no? And, and in Xbox, you have the platform, the, the video games on the cloud, you have the uh, uh, console, the hardware, you have, so do, you have different teams. The decisions happen in that team, right? Um, and, and they make the decisions, basically technical decisions about uh, what's the best way to proceed. But uh, as I said, in some cases, they are just leveraging open source projects and, and then contributing back. In some other, they get into the community because they decide to do it. So there's freedom to make these decisions. So they go and they say, "Look, I'm gonna join this project in the community. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it internally. Let's say uh, myself." So um, they are making these decisions team by team. If that makes sense. Okay, sure. Thanks. I'm sorry if, if we can just skip uh, three for a moment. Just one last, last question for me. Um, how does Microsoft decide on what to open source and what not? Uh, because surely Microsoft Windows is not open source yet and neither is Microsoft Office. Um, so, so how does this get decided? Well, I mean, whenever there's commercial software, there's um, there's a discussion if it makes to sense to release the an open source the project. And that's happening with a few projects. If you, if you track over the last few years, that's happening. We are open sourcing projects and we are leaving them. So um, I, I don't have the exact criteria for that. Uh, I suppose there's a business criteria uh, but I suppose there's also a, a technical development criteria for that project and how that uh, project can get enriched and get to a next level uh, by open sourcing or, or keeping it proprietary or commercial. Um, but I don't have exactly the, the criteria. I suppose, uh, as I said, business and technical will be coupled here and, and the decision will be um, uh, related you know, to these two uh, levers, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, I well I think at some point it will be really useful to, to publish uh, some of this so that others can learn as well about how uh, how this so that people can also be more confident about releasing their projects as open source too. Thank you. That's yeah, it sure. for me. 
Thank you, Mishari. You're uh, opening a lot of new topics here and uh, yeah, time is limited, but um, I posted in the chat a link to the Microsoft exhibition where you can also see um, the talk from uh, like the past that Microsoft gave here, um, uh, Andre. And uh, we have a few more questions. Naimish, please come in and uh, ask your question. And I also see some questions that were just addressed uh, by Mishari are related to other questions. Uh, for example, there's a question about, uh, will there be a Windows package repository um, like in Linux, for example, in future? Um, any ideas on that, Rafael? On the Linux side, uh, yeah, you mean? Good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess, I guess I'm, I'm audible. Yes, you're audible. Oh, uh, hello, Mario, Rafael, and Sudhir. First of all, thank you for this great opportunity that I can ask my questions directly to Rafael. Okay, uh, so uh, actually, I have been using a Microsoft Windows operating system for quite some time. But uh, being a student, I have been uh, recently getting comfortable with the next a lot. So uh, there are times I need to use Windows, and there are times I need to use Linux. So the greatest hurdle which I face is the incompatibility of the file system between Linux and Windows, right? Like uh, Windows does not support ext4 and other file of Linux. So uh, uh, I was searching for it that what is then because it's not to include another file system in the kernel of Windows. So what I got is the uh, Windows actually do not want to include an open source code in their proprietary software. Uh, the reason being it's a bit difficult because uh, you're, you're not so clear. You're not 100% clear. It's a bit uh, uh, wrapping up. Okay. But I think we got your question uh, about the file system. And I, I'm just going to take this question because I think that's already the core of it. So, Rafael, uh, Sudhir, any feedback on that? I'm not close to the operating systems, um, but uh, I'm not so sure is the reason that you are saying because we are including open source software in proprietary software in many projects. So there should be another reason. Um, I don't know, Sudhir, if you have any clear view on your side. Otherwise, we can take the question. And, yeah. And yeah, Nimesh, I mean, this is uh, the good point because these two are a different operating system and, you know, uh, and built by two different. Uh, you know, uh, two different uh, uh, enterprises, I would say, right? Uh, uh, and hence, there is a lot of difference. Now, today, I don't know if you notice or not, you can actually go ahead and run the Linux um, into the Windows environment. I mean, you can have a subsystem of Linux which is running onto the Windows. So you can have a one Windows version and you can work on the, both the platform. Now, making it compatible, I think it's going to require a lot of effort in terms of the engineering. And I hope you can understand that as well because you're also a technical guy uh, and you can think about, you know, what complexity is, is going to get into because it's not easy to, you know, uh, get married these two um, file system. So I think it's, it's going to take uh, a lot of time and probably you know, it's going to be huge. Uh, a big decision is going to be for either side of either Microsoft or the Linux Foundation, you know, to think about it if they're going to merge these file system into one. Yeah. Okay, Namish, I think uh, um, like there's also some discussion following your question in the chat uh, about WSL, for example, if that is an alternative and so on. And there are actually a lot of resources online uh, uh, where you can get started and definitely join some of the workshops of Force Asia, for example. Some of these topics will be discussed in, in and the. And I use that. I mean, I use WSL on my Windows platform. You know, whenever I have to work on Linux, I just, you know, uh, do it. I mean, I don't switch my laptop. Like, uh... <laughs> Like also, I think there there has been quite some rumors that there is going to be uh, uh, somewhat a mixture of Windows and Linux in the future, right? So, so what are views on it? Is it a true thing? Is it going to happen? But well, we we can't hear you a hundred percent. Now yeah. I will go to somebody else uh, to another question, and I don't think we're making the release now that uh, Windows will become. Uh, open source in this session, uh, of, of course, would be exciting, but I don't think we're going to do that now here. Uh, uh, that will probably be uh, 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 announced, like, if it ever happens on another level, but uh, there are a lot of code from different people involved, so um, I'm sure they are looking at it. And I would like to ask then uh, Daniel Blumen for the last question, um, and because we don't have enough time for all the questions. I see a lot of questions, but Daniel, please, if you want to come in and ask your question live, um, and uh, yeah, we don't have so much time left. So, uh, but like maybe you can get an initial answer. All right. Um, 
Hi guys, yeah. So, um, what potential do you see for Microsoft to develop either a cloud or on-prem desktop OS, um, which uses a Linux kernel underneath? Hmm. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, really, uh, Daniel. Uh, as I said, I, I'm not that close to to the desktop uh, team. I know there was a Linux subsystem already into in the Windows provided by Canonical. Um, look, I mean, everything is possible. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I don't really know what would be the. I, I can say also, Microsoft is not so much focused now on the um, desktop as such. Um, and, and how to say, I mean, Windows is a fantastic, uh, we think, is, is a good operating system. Uh, there's innovation in, in the operating system, but I would say our focus is clearly now on the cloud. And that's where we are putting a lot of energy and, let's say, horsepower or manpower, no, to, to get it uh, done. But um, I don't know so if you have any... And so, in fact, it actually could be possibly um, an OS or like UI that runs in the cloud um, on like Azure. Hmm. Well, that, that could be too, yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and there are operating systems already, as I told you, know, we, we are running different community and we are running different ISV uh, operating systems. Um, I'm not aware as of today of any specific plans, uh, but it might be the case. Why not? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Maybe, uh, Rafael, something to take back. Uh, as you said, you're customer driven and, um, yeah customer, community, developer-driven, so maybe we can all bring this together. There's apparently an interest, and I see Hong Fook is joining us for a last small question. It's good like uh, to have a, a woman here in this uh, session. Please go ahead, Hong Fook. So uh, I, I there are a lot of questions already. I just want to jump in to say thank you um, to, of course, Raphael and, and Sudhir for this presentation, but but also to Microsoft. Um, and I want to thank you on behalf of two organizations. I'm, I'm on the board of the OSI, Open Source Initiative, a vice president. And I want to confirm that we've been receiving support uh, from Microsoft for um, the past few years. And we really appreciate that um, uh, Microsoft uh, continue to support um, open source community and on behalf of Force Asia and this is also not the first time uh, Microsoft come to the Force Asia summit it's been several years already and I also been very close um, uh, in touch with Sin who who a great person always like um, really supportive to us and I want to say again thank you very much for um, for your contribution and for your continued support to the open source community to grow the community in Asia thank you no thank you thank you to, to host, for hosting us thank and thank you for the collaboration. At the beginning, it was not that easy. Uh, Hong Fu, when I started, trust me, it was not that easy. I was all on a vision, and the vision is is happening. Uh, that vision, we are realizing on that vision. And as I said, judge us for what we do and try us. That's the only thing that I can say. Be open. Don't be close to Microsoft. Okay, so these are great final works. And uh, by the way, um, I also want to relay a thank you from the developers because uh, um, Raphael discovered uh, some bugs in the event management system here that we have that only actually uh, appeared for him. So uh, we uh, could identify these bugs uh, with the help and that's a great uh, cooperation on many different levels. So thank you very much uh, for everyone. Um, and we will have um, more sessions on Microsoft, also diversity panel, as we saw today in the session, it's very male dominated. Um, so um, definitely there's an opportunity for women as well. So uh, we are moving on to the next session in a moment, but um, thank you very much for this session. And um, I'm sure we will follow up on all the questions that uh, weren't answered yet. So it's been great with you here with uh, Raphael and uh, Sudhir. We 